Let me check that. We are live. Okay, we are live. Uh, here's the agenda. And, um, okay, this is the questions that came up yesterday on 2.30 on Mike Fisher. Uh, I think we understood why, I mean, this bill is on life support right now. No. <laughs> uh, but the question came up, we kind of understood why you couldn't offer or try and sell, solicit a Medicare Advantage plan to someone on Medicaid, because Medicaid was covering your medical expenses. But we weren't clear as to what a Medicare savings plan was and why we would want to ban someone from right. buying a... So before going into the details, of, and I'm happy to... I, I got a new name for you. Yeah, by the way, my name is Mike Fisher. I'm out there. But, um, in the day and age with video, I'm not sure we still need on the record. I'll just go on the record saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> Whatever you say is out there in the ether. It can <laughs> never be pulled back. Exactly. Um, you know, I uh, am spending a tremendous amount of time this year uh, advocating around this area of health policy. And so I can absolutely walk the committee through the various levels of Medicare savings plan and how they work differently and how they would impact differently for somebody with regard to a Part C plan. But um, we have done only a cursory legal analysis of the legality of this section. And section four. Section seven, I think it is the yeah, section. the last section in the bill. Right. And, um, and so it's not a full legal analysis, but we are led to believe that uh, we are not confident that it is legal for the state to limit who can buy Part C, even though I think it would be very good policy to not allow certain sets of people to buy a Part C plan. I'm not convinced the state has the legal authority to do so. So, okay. so that might make this uh, quicker. <laughs> that might make it quicker, or um, it might pull it off life support. But but let and, and, and let me um, and let me just say for a second though that this concept of someone coming off of a Part C plan and the limitations going back to traditional Medicare yeah. is around the purchasing of um, a Medicare supplemental plan for a person who's on MABD Medicaid. They have full coverage. They don't need a supplemental plan. And similarly, for someone who is on the Quimby level, qualified Medicare beneficiary, oh, okay. the Quimby level of uh, the Medicare savings plan, that for that population of people, currently up to 100% of the federal poverty level, um, uh, that person also, I, never, I try not to do this without, I, I always want to, you say a number like that, and 100% um, of the federal poverty level or $1,255 a month of income. Someone who's under that. 14,000. We're talking tremendously over. Mm -hmm. um, that, that person as well um, would be, um, would not need a supplemental plan. Okay. And so, um, uh, so um, they they have probably better benefits when it comes to medical, not teeth and dental. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and then if I might just take a second to let you know, uh, in this area of health policy, there's quite a lot of work going on in the house that, if successful, will come to you, and it is um, uh, moving on a proposal that that the chair introduced in the Senate to increase the eligibility for these programs. And um, I, I'll just report to you that there's um, been a lot of work in House Health Care Committee. I think there's a good chance a real improvement to this area of health policy is going to come out. And, um, and the crib notes, because I know it's not what you're talking about here, is that it wouldn't start until January of 26, so it's not an FY25 budget item, only half of an FY26 budget item, and it would cost 
and its most generous model uh, around fifteen million dollars of base. And and so you so pause on that for a minute. Fifteen million dollars is a lot of money, and would result in over forty million dollars of money in low income seniors' pockets. That is them not having to pay their Part B premiums anymore. Two thousand dollars a piece. Two thousand ninety six dollars a piece for nineteen thousand two hundred and seventeen people is what Diva estimates. Forty million dollars in low income senior and disabled people. I home. remember Beth Pierce when she was treasurer had a statistic like eighty percent of the lodgers are relying on Medicare for their living upon retirement. I think they had like eighty dollars in savings. And we have a lot of very poor people. Right. So the return on investment and that's only half of it, there's another half, maybe 30 million that would go, that would improve their access to care. Um, so um, obviously I'm making a pitch that this is a good investment. What, what is the cost again? About, about $15 million. Okay. Right? Well, $15 million and the additional cost of the total return for all employees, employees for people involved we covered would be what? Uh, $40 40 million dollars in reduced part B premiums and an additional um, about 60 million, uh, 55 million in improved access. Is that 15, is that one time cost as opposed to an annual cost? Ongoing, an annual Medicare. Annual $15 million ongoing cost. And if the money that gets paid out to those individuals now uh, for additional medical care and so on and so forth, that is a cost that we bear through why? So that's a good question. The costs today, so it it the, the benefits do replace, um, I think you're asking, I'm not sure, uh, replace expenditures that uh, I would argue are not being paid today. People are getting fair. They can't pay those bills. They uh, the, the Those claims go to bad debt or- yeah, That's what I'm trying to figure out is where, where does the money that is recovered, quote unquote, come from? Right. And is it something that is a state expenditure Five expenditure, or is it simply uncompensated? So, so a big piece of it is just the straight up federal matching, the run on federal dollars, um, and then there's a whole other category that represents an estimated fifty million dollars that is drawing down federal funding, hundred percent federal funding for the prescription drug benefit that we currently uh, for newly eligible. So, and I can walk you through in much more detail, not at the state at this moment, I think, um, because we've been doing a lot of modeling and a lot of exploring about it. So what I mean to say is there's real progress in this, this perspective, potential, real power, progress in this area. Um, and then lastly, let me just say, um, I, I think even if you just do the advertising section of S230, it's still worth doing. Well, that's just my, my yeah, whole opinion. I, is, I was thinking that, but DFR has already told us that they're doing that. So the only way I could justify telling them to do what they're going to do is if I could get them some money. And the minute I say that right across the hall, I get the evil eye. Well, so. well, but let me say just a little bit differently. Um, um, currently, the federal government preempts us on uh, regulating Part C advertising as well. And there is an active conversation uh, uh, about the uh, allowing states to take over that regulation. And, uh, and DFR submitted a comment saying that we would like the feds to allow us to do that. Um, and so we would be, in effect, getting being ready for that should it come to be. Um, and the potential budgetary impact, if we were really asking DFR to enter into this space, I think should be asked or answered after we have the real question. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions for the Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mitty, before we go home, I, Senator Brock, this was your question. This 
think we have resolved everything else. If we do nothing, then whatever changes will be made are moved. Um, we're back to what we're doing now. It sounds like a lot of that is changing. So unless somebody asks me to take this bill off, listen to Emily Brown first, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm feeling it somewhat unbooked from the support. Mm -hmm. Okay. I agree. Okay. All right. Not saying that we wouldn't like to, <laughs> to do something. We mm -hmm. just are preempted on the rendering anything of any any significance. Okay. Kirby is not here yet. Can we email Kirby and see if he can I could, but he said it'll be here in one minute. So. Oh, okay. You already heard from him, no we will wait. And I know. Sorry. Yeah. Yay. Thank you. How fitting. No, here. No, 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 so unless I hear the difference, I'm going to put this on the, the dead list. Um, we haven't got too much else up there. We have some candy and soda taxes. I don't know. I'm going to do any kind of a funding package. I think it's going to get stuck on miscellaneous tax because I don't think um, the house would like us to look at the cloud tax. So that's what we can put on Kirby's cloud tax. So Do you want to preview the stuff from S311 in here, Steve? Oh, yes. As I was going to ask Senator Bray when he came in when he thought he would be free of 311, or we could take it up. Is that the PUC one? Is the housing bill? Housing bill. Oh, the housing bill. If so, you're not taking it up tomorrow, right? <laughs> no. Okay. Would it be okay with you if we took testimony and then when you're finished with it, I'm assuming it will come here because there's tax stuff in it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I don't, you know, I don't know if we want to go through the formality of referring the bill here and sending it back, but um, I, I would think you could just take testimony. Okay. Anyway, I mean, we were right. doing stuff. Nineteen fifty before we had exactly. Yeah, I I thought we were working together with you on that one. Okay, we will take some testimony and do a further process. And I yeah. I know there was a wish by the administration that there were more tax pieces. Right. And they have said that for some reason they think this committee is a pushover. Um and we will really? definitely take more money out of the problem. They haven't spent much time in this committee. So <laughs> anyway. Um, thank you. Yeah, yeah waiting for Kirby to show up. He would like and he's back to book work. I see. Maybe the sets of that. So we can set up a walkthrough. That would be yeah. Alan next week. And then uh, the tax pieces. Yeah. Tax pieces are Kirby. Oh, Kirby. Okay. We will have Kirby walk through the tax section. And then we will ask um, the tax department to come talk. So, right. Uh, and Ellen would only come in if we wanted to talk about any fees we're losing from Act 250, but that's um, kind of a week that might be. So, yeah, we know what's Okay, happening. well, we'll, we will start out looking at the taxes. We will hear what the administration would like to add and why. Right. Um, but I do really walk through of the bill so that we know we're not, we know what, what, in what context we're yeah. doing these things. So that we don't, yeah, I like to know how things fit in. And Kirby's not here, it's been four minutes. We must have gotten really good. Really. Check out my mail, guys.
Was a good cookie. It's like it's chocolate. Good. They always cook all the way. Thanks. That is the first one I've had this year. Really? Mm -hmm. I think I. I didn't know why today. It's like. <laughs> well, where do you have it? Out here. I'm like, it's it's really good. Good. No, no, it's usually really good. good. I'm not a team. Sometimes it must be that magic combination of fat, sugar, and butter. So that fat, right? You move the CD or the bill out of here. It's on notice calendar and salt and sugar. But chocolate sticks out here. And this hit me was the one to go on. Yeah, not every so we get referred to yeah. all real guys. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we can move that oh, mm -hmm. I think that that is an underestimated. Mm -hmm. Many were in the and uh, built in colors. Right. Did you see that? There was a network show called Salt. Oh. Oh. So, so how much has never taken? I didn't get all the way through. Well, well, I mean, like yeah. three hours <laughs> out. You're saying it won't get her. She right? wasn't that yeah. interesting because she could go yeah. somewhere. She so wouldn't have been from the kitchen. She got the problem. She got all the crackers for you. You're yeah. spoiled about it. You won't talk to her. No, it didn't get there. We're all talking about it. I think it's shit. Yeah. So, we're going to go off live. We can go off live. Do you have a curfew tea or something? We don't have a curfew. Yes. Miss Kirby. Okay, more is yours. And this is 181. And as you remember, we asked this is for the pairing of the peg uh, funding for the peg local uh, EP access and internet access. And we asked Kirby to go to see if. A, we, we get in trouble with the streamlined sales pack people. If we put an excise or some kind of a surcharge on streaming services in this state. Um, I have had a request from Appropriations who is struggling to get any kind of budget together this year. That any, if we decide to do that, that any new funding we develop be sent to appropriations and that then uh, they have control over how the money is being spent because if you give a dedicated source then you may find out that you desperately need money somewhere and you have no control over the source so that is a request i think it's reasonable we try to get everything we can through the budget so all the needs get balanced but Kirby, this is up on the website, right? It's under yesterday. It's, it's, it's moving on the, the website. Okay. Oh, the thing is, the, the link I'm trying to get on the Zoom with, um, is it showing up for you? Uh, no, I'm going to send you a video. Okay. So I have some Kirby key list of council. I have some draft language at the fits. The beginnings of what could be a gross receipts tax. It's, um, the language calls it an assessment for uh, streaming entertainment services. There's a few wrinkles with this approach that I want everyone to be aware of as as I look into it. Uh, and we'll look at the language in a second here. But so for this entire concept, one thing that we have to be aware of is. There's something, there's a federal law called the Internet Tax Freedom Act. And it prevents a state from having a discriminatory tax on uh, what's called electronic commerce transactions compared with non electronic commerce transactions. And, it's it. and uh, it just means that that we have to keep some things in mind to make sure that it doesn't end up being discriminatory. Um, so what I drafted here, for instance, 
And I'm doing more research on this, so do do want to stress that it's a work in progress, but okay. What so for starters, I wrote this to be five percent on the gross receipts of cable and streaming. So at least hopefully under that federal law I mentioned, if if we're applying the same treatment to cable as streaming, okay, that it would that it's clear that it's not discriminatory. Okay, I drafted some purpose language here that puts, that sets out that it is the intent of General Assembly that cable companies and streaming services contribute equally to the non-commercial content provided by access management organizations. To to make sure that we're that we're following federal law and we're having problems with that. There's some other questions though to think about, such as satellite TV. That's not yes. something. Uh, we have tried that. And um, what is it? The satellite TV stations ran runners. You know, it's check. Your legislators are going up your, yeah, you won't be able to board your TV. It didn't quite have Big Bird in it, but it was definitely generating a lot of emails. So, so that's one thing to think about is, is you know what the tax base would be for the well, uh, maybe mm -hmm. satellites. If we're taxing everything else, mm -hmm. it would seem that we should get satellites, and maybe we'll take that. So, one thing to think about with the satellite question is the focus on this, and you know, it's coming out of S one eighty one, which which relates to right ways and the other the other or the other uh, states like Massachusetts that uh, are do that are looking into doing something like this they're also focusing on streaming using right of ways as a reason for having tags like this same argument doesn't exactly exist for satellite um, but you know so this is phrased to be infrastructure generally including those in public as of way um, so that's one issue. Uh, to think about this. Um, another thing is that under federal law, the 5% the franchise fee on people uh, is allowed under federal law, but it has to stay at 5% or, okay. you know. So, uh, however, this is put together, people should not end up paying more than the 5% franchise fee. Okay, I know that there's been some concern about some of the original wording that even cable is going to be taxed about. Yeah. So currently, and I, I need to meet with Maria, who's the Ledge Council attorney who, who deals with a lot of this stuff usually. Um, but my understanding is the that five percent franchise fee, how that's you how that's implemented in Vermont is at least partly through public service board rule eight. Um, but under rule eight, there's some negotiations between the AMOs and the cable providers. I'm not sure that we're actually that the cable providers are actually paying exactly five percent. So if we want to make it equal between streaming and cable, uh, we need to make sure that Vermont law is, you know, so so it, it might require moving away from, for instance, maybe moving away from the rule eight way of doing it and doing it under a bill like this, where it's just the same percent, it doesn't have to be five percent, it just can't be more than five percent, the same percentage across the board. Uh, so, so that's one thing to think about is just how cable is treated. I think there's also limitations for how the money for cable can be used, uh, which is something I need to look into a bit more. Yeah, okay, well, it sounds like we need to have Maria take a look at that and we want to come talk to us. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, not, I'm going to meet with her. So those are some issues. We also talked about Streamline last time. Uh, I've reached out. I know Streamline's taking a look at this to uh, decide whether Vermont doing something like this would be considered a violation of Streamline as a replacement tax or having an additional rate above the sales tax. Uh, they're still looking at it. They haven't gone back to me, but um, that's that's something we'll need to know about too. If it's only on streaming in Vermont, it shouldn't impact other. So, yeah, so we'll, raise the sales tax on streaming to 10 percent um and that would just be it if you're streaming in one month that should tax so <laughs> streamline though has uh it limits how much how many different tax rates the state can have 
Okay. So if it's interpreted that there's a higher tax rate, a higher sales tax rate for streaming, you only have one else. rate. Right. <laughs> so we must have some way. I mean, no others. I mean, in Denver, there was a sales tax for the historic district, and there's another for, you know, and most of them have state, county. Uh, we're pretty minimal. So no. the rate, we don't have different rates. The different classes of what you want to do. Yeah, so the, so those are the those are the uh, big uh, issues that we're still trying to figure out and um, we'll be learning more about. I can tell you that I think the house is also interested in this concept and has ideas, so there might be uh, a bill developed over there. Around this, uh, but we can we can go through the basics of, of what I had here to start. Do that. And it's up on your yesterday's. It should be today. It's on today's. Okay. So the the gist of this approach is that. Streaming entertainment operators and cable companies would both provide financial statements to the Department of Taxes every six months. And then the department would use those statements to determine what 5% of the gross receipts that are, of course, that are tied to Vermont streaming and, and cable only. Uh, they would take that to, to then assess the company for tax. The company, I think, would have 30 days then to pay that. Okay, so this is not doing anything to the present cable franchise or franchise fee. This is just saying that streaming services are on top of that. So, 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 you're, so you're putting them both in the same boat, so obviously we're not discriminating. But, but yeah, what I was getting at before is that we, we would have to, I, I, you would have to reveal, I think, the, the the cable franchise fee as it is now okay. and, and replace it with this. Okay. It, this would effectively yeah. be the same thing. Once we decide on this, we can draft up the repeat. Okay. Change. So if, if we went down that path and we repealed the 5% cable franchise fee and then set at this 5% gross annual revenues on all streaming and cable providers, would that then Stop collecting the six percent state sales tax. We are all written up. So this would be the gross receipts and the sales tax. Thank you. Yes. Is there a definition difference between a gross receipts tax and an excise tax? Or are they equatable in your mind? I think an, an excise tax, in my mind, is a, is a bit more broad. I mean, gross receipts is specifically on the gross receipts. Excise would be specific volumes full rather than gross receipts is on all revenues generated across all activities. I don't I don't think of an excise tax as being a specific thing, but maybe there, that, that might just be the best one. Excise tax was usually a luxury tax when it started. If you bought a big coat, if you paid a sales tax plus an excise tax because you're buying a luxury item. One more question. Yeah. So I this came to me at lunch, so probably I should call you before I ended up. Uh, no worries if you don't have an answer to this. Do you do you detect or anticipate any possible reclassification concerns if we go down this route? Would streaming service providers be easily be able to requalify or classify their services as cable services to avoid the sales tax to you know to that group? Um I don't think I don't think that would be a concern. The definitions here, which are based the basis point is what Massachusetts is doing as the dollars. There's a definition for streaming entertainment services, which is any paid service that provides audio, video, or computer generated or computer augmented entertainment and delivers such entertainment via digital infrastructure to users and uh, delivers those services through facilities located at least in part in the public rights of way without regard to delivery technology, including internet protocol technology or other intelligences. And then this definition does not include, and these are some things that federal law would prevent us from touching. Uh, and then there's a cable, there's video programming definition, 
just means programming provided by like an early computer comparable to programming provided by a television broadcast station. And this is this is meant to to capture the way that the, the way that it's written out right now is the companies that offer video programming in Vermont and those that offer streaming entertainment services in Vermont would uh, would be um, what the tax is based off of those things. So for cable, it would be the video programming. Um, you might need to, and again, so I'm, I've just been kind of throwing this together over a couple of days. We we might need to flesh out the video programming definition, but also make sure it excludes everything that federally acts. But the idea is that it doesn't matter, to answer your question more directly, it doesn't matter if streaming service starts calling what they're providing, something else that meets to solve the definition here. I mean, there's still, if it's offering video programming, it's still be such a. So we need you to do that, some further refining, I guess. But I know there's some people in the room, I think, one, um, that had some concerns about this board. So I'm gonna let them talk before we do any more. Okay. We'll, and you can run this by Maria to make sure we're not running foul of the feds. Yeah. And I think we need to learn how much money we might be raising by doing yeah. this. Wow. It looked like we were raising a lot more than the fact we needed with the poll attachment because the testimony of the other day was free. And then uh, we did have some graphs, but the franchise fee is not declining at this point. It is starting, it is moving on. Okay, but if we've been taxing cable this whole time at a rate that we haven't been taxing streaming services, and now we just create equity. And it does create a lot of new revenue. Can we look toward the education fund? Yeah. We could sales tax, or we could do it as dedicated. I mean, we write the laws, we can do it. But I think this would this be a sales tax? This would go that fund? No, this, oh. this would definitely not be sales tax. It would um, not be a sales tax. Uh, I mean, that's the goal of reaching out to Streamline is to make sure Streamline recognizes it's not a sales tax. Okay. Um, but we're already, we already are getting 6% sales tax. This is, uh, okay, yeah, this is over and above that. Uh, yeah, it would be in addition. And uh, like I said before, I, I haven't had time to look into all the limitations around the franchise fee for cable, but I think there are limitations on what the revenues or under that, um, but it, okay, at, this, at this point, I'm not entirely yeah. clear of all the details. But that would be a reason why we wouldn't be able to use it for some other purpose. Okay. I mean, if we, oh, yeah, I got okay. You. So we'll try and we'll work on that. The same in the corner. Does this get to not be a sales tax because we don't notify, we don't identify it as such at the time of purchase? It's uh, so sell, the sales tax is imposed on the purchaser of the product and it's collected by the company and remitted yeah. to, to, to the city based on what the, the yeah. item costs. Yeah. And, and this is a tax that's on all of the receipts, the income coming in for the company, and the company pays 5% of the receipts it's, it's, it's receiving from Vermont. Sales. Okay, so we're getting it from different things. One is the customer that buys mm -hmm. the movies, and the other is the company that is selling the movies. So the sales tax is paid by the buyer and the vendors. This additional excise tax for what? I, I wrote assessment. Assessment is, is okay. Is for as paid by the company that is selling the streaming service based on how much money they're making out of selling. Now, we did that with the heating fuel, and the bills came. I don't have to put in a portion of the bill that's going to pay the company's taxes. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, no, they didn't. Know. That's yes, probably I, what they did. This I think. It's standard understanding is that you tax businesses, that's likely yeah. in part or all will be passed on to the customer. 
So it's experienced as a sales tax. Uh, no, well, but the customer is paying the sales tax. Yeah. It's not it's not experienced as sales tax. It's more of an assessment on their income to the seller. If the seller puts it on, if it's like my phone bill, it will say government fees and assessments. Uh, and there's just an un, there's a number after it. One thing we could look into is uh, having a provision in the bill stating that companies can't do that possibly. If they can't uh, tell the customer that we have it. We had such a customers. statement with fuel oil, yeah, and then we withdrew the statement. So, saying, go ahead, put it in. Yeah, because yeah. people saw it as a free speech issue. Yeah. No, because the fuel companies wished to um, put a horn in the uh, in the shoe of the yeah. Yeah. Okay, energy. So it's unclear to me, and maybe you didn't articulate this, if we will soup up either intentionally or unintentionally game services, bundled services, or even uh, like tune in pure audio services. I do see video programming defined, but uh, I don't see video programming in the streaming services definition. But do you feel like our intent would be to include game services, like whatever I pay for my kids' Nintendo uh, bundled services like Amazon Prime, which includes a variety of things, including video content and also audio services. Uh, yeah, the the streaming definition covers audio services, computer generated or computer augmented entertainment. So if I buy the audio book, Kim, I'm going to pay Those. an additional tax on that if I buy because I have Amazon Prime. If I buy a book from Kindle. I pay a sales tax, but it's not. So it's no audio to it. It's just a book. So those computers. those companies would be subject to the gross receipts tax, whether you pay it or the company pays it. Those different so, questions. The but if pay. Amazon sells and Amazon Prime sells a lot more than video services, I just don't want to start getting complaints because people are buying. 10 things of toothpaste and uh, you know paper towels from Amazon and they're getting hit with a streaming tax. I think we might we'd have to find out if they could even do it. So the limitation like Amazon for instance would not have to pay gross receipts on all of Amazon's receipts. It would be the revenues derived from the sale or provision of streaming entertainment services and video programming to individuals and businesses in Vermont. Okay. So I have Amazon Prime, I pay $140 and that allows me to get like discounted shipping and it also access to Free video content. So I, mean, I don't know how we would disambiguate. It would be the whole amount. Okay. It, yeah, okay. that's the question. Yeah, well, we'd have to ask if they, have a feeling their accounting system for sure. Like them. Um, is it pretty sophisticated? But yeah, so now uh, I'm thinking just streaming the Disney Channel, uh, Netflix, there's um, music channels, and then gaming channels. But I mean, it's, yeah, I guess if you're buying gaming channels through Amazon or any other retail, you better pay it on. That purchase only though their gross proceeds from the sale of the audio books or films or something, but not on hard reading material, um, paper towels, anything that else is bought by Amazon. One more question I have for you uh, in your research and maybe following up later on is it's intriguing to me to what the origin and rationale for the cable franchise fee was originally. Uh, I, I am under the impression that I can be dissuaded of this, that it was to have those that were generating content selling into the state, but not having a physical presence in the state to fund local capacity and capabilities to broadcast uh, the local broadcasting that I think of with Wayne's World when I grew up. And so to, to that end, if that is the case, and if, I, if I'm not completely off, I still see this as a fair compensate, a fair uh, fee to assess on people selling content that's made outside of Vermont into Vermont mm -hmm. to fund the capabilities and competencies of local right. providers and local broadcasters. 
But I, I'm just curious if you can point me in, in in your research any rationale for the original Cato franchise fee to see if my history. That's probably more Maria's building, but we definitely want Maria because we're dealing in in internet structures and cables <laughs> and interstate. We'll have Maria take a look at it. And, um, I'll wait until Logan will show. It was a movie. Okay, though. I was like, it was an SNL skin. Yeah, great film. Okay. <laughs> Full disclosure. I just watched Happy Dude. In high school, I did a public <laughs> access show with my friends. I had a segment called Tom's Time, so you can all get that. Okay. Is that on YouTube? Oh, yes. <laughs> have we got any more? <laughs> have we got any more questions for Kirby? Oh, thank you. Um, Dylan, you want us to come up and express some of the concerns or things we might be aware of? Before you start, I mean, Kirby, I think we've got a. Oh yeah, my tenant career. Whenever I was going to do community access television, I said, "Oh yeah, I'm going to get this on Lane's fault." Okay. Welcome. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Joe is with the Lee and Public Affairs uh, here today for you on the behalf of the New England Connectivity and Telecommunications Association, or NECTA. Uh, NECTA is the regional trade group that uh, represents predominantly the private tel uh, cable companies, uh, among others, in the state of Vermont. Um, we do have some issues with the draft before you today. I think Mr. Keaton had acknowledged that there are some outstanding questions. Um, we would reinforce those and perhaps raise a few more. Um, first of all, just you know, right off the bat, the reference to both cable operators and streaming uh, entertainment operators is a problem for us. Um, as Mr. Deacon acknowledged, we do already pay the full 5% uh, of gross revenue to um, Vermont's access management organizations with PEGS. I will just note, you know, for the record, it, it is somewhat unique for the full 5% franchise fee, both to be assessed and then also to go 100% to pay uh, in the region. Uh, other states, for example, Massachusetts, the franchise fee is negotiated at a uh, local municipal basis. And so that varies across the state, um, but it is relatively unique in our experience for all of that revenue to go to the pegs. We do have, as the chair indicated, you know, a summary of uh, the revenue that has come from NECTA members over the course of the last 12 years. Uh, it has risen uh, over that period of time from uh, $4.8 million in 2010 uh, to $6.29 million in uh, 2022. Uh, that is in addition to uh, $11 million. And what I think Mr. Kirby was referring to, the negotiated number is for capital expenditures. Uh, and that is between the uh, cable company and, and, and access management organizations territory and that organization that they as part of their um, arrangement go and figure out what the capital needs are and then contribute above and beyond the 5% um, franchise fee. Um, so, you know, the numbers, I, I only have gone back to 2013 for the total contributions, but it goes from 5.75 million in 2013 for the combined revenue up to Six uh, seven point three six million in uh, twenty twenty two. So just to put some numbers on what we're so talking we about here. We started this with the idea that the revenues would go again. They did for a while. Now they're starting to go up. There seems to be some, I guess, disagreement on the actual numbers or the adequacy. Perhaps it's not that the numbers are going up. Maybe. They're just not going to be too productive inflation. I have, you know, you would have to ask the individual and knows what their need is um, and how that's changed over the years. I do know that based on the graph that is from the Vermont Access Network's testimony I submitted earlier this week, it does look that the projected revenues remain relatively stable, but the need is increasing pretty significantly that's above and beyond what revenues may be doing. So that's question, policy question for today. Um, just turning to the bill before you today, um, you know, the, the double assessment on both the franchise fee and then also if this were to be enacted, I um, appreciate that you may want to repeal the franchise fee. That is set as part of each cable operator's certificate of public good with the Public Utility Commission. So it's a contract for the state. I don't know what the implications would be. Uh, of I have a feeling something. we don't have the power to remove a PUC condition. Yes. But we will check. Uh, in, in addition to the Internet Tax Freedom Act that 
the Cable Act uh, is what governs the franchise fee. That that five percent is the maximum that you can assess that state can assess on the video service provided by cable operators. So to do anything above and beyond that would, I think, be a okay, clear no, violation of federal law. Uh, cable, uh, there's no intention to do anything to cable operators. Yeah, that's what we're trying to see is if streaming businesses were, in fact, the same as cable operators. Sure. If they were just using the cable as a service to sell something in Vermont. And I yep. think that's where we were looking. Sure. So I can turn my attention to the streaming side of things. Um, we do feel that the definition of streaming entertainment services is overly broad as the committee has started to dig into. This is, I think, exceptionally more broad than what the committee's discussion has been to this point to tax, uh, put an additional charge on what you would think of as the kind of over-the-top video service providers that have been referenced. I won't call them out by name, but I think now you're talking about. Uh, this would appear to include any uh, form of entertainment delivered via the internet. So we're thinking ebooks, comics, video games, news websites, chat ops, right. online sports betting. Um, so anything was, that doesn't come over your local cable channel. Any, that, I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's a very broad definition. So I think okay. if the committee were to want to move forward with some version of this, you may want to contemplate kind of narrowing the universe of entities that you're trying to subject to, to, to this tax. You may run into challenges there with the Internet Tax Freedom Act. I don't, I don't have the answer for you okay. today. Um, the next concern would be the definition of gross revenue is, I think, overly broad. Um, it includes to potentially could wrap in advertising revenue or other revenue that entities may take in. Um, so free ad-free services like YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, Reddit, that do collect revenue in the state of Vermont uh, and provide entertainment services um, could get drawn in. I don't, you know, maybe PBS or NPR who also stream their content um, and collect revenue that may not be from, um, Stream. from streaming um, could potentially get drawn into this. Um, we so you taxing all our broadcasts and our meetings. Um, and then, so one of the other additional layer of complexity is that, so if you are a, a cable customer in Vermont, you through your set top box could subscribe to a service like Netflix. Um, in that scenario, uh, generally speaking, it might be your cable operator who's actually collecting that revenue on behalf of Netflix or another streaming service. Um, the, Bill narrows the scope of companies that are uh, selling or provisioning service. So in that example, um, Comcast, for example, may be selling the Netflix service, but Netflix is provisioning the service, then are they, who, which revenue are you actually assessing that against? It gets somewhat complicated. Another example would be Activision, Blizzard owns subsidiary Microsoft, I believe they, they own a video game company. Um, you might purchase the video game content through a uh, streaming service, through a service like Steam, for example. Steam processes the transaction, but uh, Activision is actually giving you the, the video game service. Mm -hmm. Who's, who is the entity you're actually trying to collect? Um, so that's kind of one uh, final uh, concern. And then with to Senator Ron Hinsdale's point about parity, I think it is important to note that you can simultaneously be a cable subscriber paying the 5% franchise fee, which does show up on your bill in addition to sales tax, and then also subscribe to services, uh, over the top services. Uh, so if this is, you are continuing to pay perhaps the same amount, you always pay, you would be paying more. I'm not sure how you separate out um, to make sure that it's, I'm not sure there's a Venn diagram of individuals who are not cab currently cable subscribers, but are um, purchasers of this typical um, streaming service. Um, and then just finally, with respect to uh, the, you know, I understand that this bill was kind of based on a piece of legislation that has been introduced in Massachusetts. Just for some context, that bill has been introduced two years in a row and has not made it out of committee. So um, we're not going so far as to say that it is law in Massachusetts. I think many of the reasons why it may not have moved forward is some of the questions that to drop your attention today. I, I feel like I keep explaining this incorrectly, but I am not, I am not particularly concerned if someone pays the same rate for both for any television type service that they 
that they buy. I'm only concerned if they pay a different rate for those things. So if they have their $60 cable package and their $15 streaming service, as long as they are paying the same percentage on both, I'm satisfied. I, I think that's just a percentage of the overall package you purchase for entertainment, which some people have larger or smaller cable packages. Some people have three different streaming services. So I am okay with someone being charged for having both types of entertainment packages. Similarly, what's revealing in this conversation to me is I, I'm now question, wondering, do cable service providers pay our sales tax of 6%? Uh, the customer does. Yes. The customer pays, okay. So right now, cable providers are getting the 5% franchise fee as a gross receipts, gross, excise, revenue. gross revenue, and the, the consumers are paying the 6%. And and to be clear, the both the 5% and the 6% show up on customers' bill. Yeah. Right now, the streaming providers are just paying that 6%. They're, customers of streaming is up. They are not paying that 5% franchise fee. Correct. So this would be pure. Pure. Okay. Yeah, I was hoping Joy Fiscal would be here, but we'll have them in. Because I don't, if we do everybody the same rate, I don't know if it's going to raise enough money. If we're wanting $3 million. I think it should do more than that, but maybe we can find out. Yeah. And I did just, I think I've been clear, but I did just, I know Mr. Kirby had kind of noted that he may not know whether cable companies are paying full 5%. They are paying full 5% for that. Okay. I, yeah. Go ahead. Just more, one concern I do have, which is very valid, I, I don't know if I want to scoop in all of the services under the sun. And so I, I do like in Kirby's language how he defines video programming. It means programming provided by or generally considered comparable to programming provided by a television broadcast station. So it, it, my intention in this conversation is to focus on video programming providers, be it through cable mediums or over the top internet services and not gaming services. Yes, yeah, so and that would be about gaming services. Well, the yeah. Yeah. That, but I can be persuaded otherwise, just that's where I started this conversation. Why, 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 why tax the one? Yeah. Because, if I may sure. I started in this hearing or having the impression that cable uh, services were on the decline as more and more, myself included, were cutting the cord, so to speak, and, mm -hmm. and paying for on the top services, which I have the impression, but somewhat swayed of late, that that is translated to reduce funding for our local peg providers. Yeah, yeah. And so to look for refunding that for the video content being sold into the state, I saw the streaming providers as the, as the focus, not gamers. But I'm not against, I mean, if you want to have that broader discussion, I just hadn't contemplated taxing gaming services, uh, TuneIn, um, Pandora, Spotify, like audio services as well. So certainly it happens. Something to talk about. Yeah. And I think half the committee wasn't here. Uh, we have been asked if we raise any money to please dedicate it to the general fund so that it could then be budgeted out, um, possibly, but that they discourage us giving dedicated sources because when budgets get really tight, um, you may want to decide one of those dedicated sources isn't as valuable as health services or something. So, um, do not be a I don't Could know. The, I, the sales tax is going to be. want to be in charge. So. The sales tax yeah, is, yeah, and we fight for our we could, Well, <laughs> um, the purpose of looking at this was for PEG. Right. Um, <clears throat> but we're rather desperate straits in the end fund to just say. So, um, <laughs> All, I mean, all everything is on the table and until it's voted out. So, um, any questions for Dylan? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, yeah, it's interesting that I, I get the whole flexibility thing, it's anything for the city general fund. Um, at the same time, when sometimes when we're trying to figure out a tax, it's because we're feeling like someone should carry their own water. So there's that nexus that we keep looking for. Uh, yeah. So it's a little bit of a tug of war. 
They call that reactions. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. We, I think Emily Brown, is she? She's just like Emily Brown, she's running a few minutes late, she has a meeting, so. Okay, you want to take about a five minute break? Um, give Emily time, she can raise in me, so. I don't think they're asking about the same thing you're asking us. 